Now, Dr. Burke, uh, your research shows that uh, if all of the United States had been fluoridated, that would mean uh, about 70,000 extra deaths because of cancer per annum. Those are remarkable, impressive, and in fact, rather disquieting figures. Could you shortly describe your research in this field and what results did you get from it? Yes. The 70,000, of course, represents, would represent one-fifth of all the cancer deaths in the United States, twice as many from breast cancer in women and twice as many as from lung cancer in man. Uh, to our studies involve comparing the deaths of all persons in the 10 largest fluoridated cities of the United States with the 10 largest non-fluoridated cities in the United States year by year. And we obtained a very remarkable curve, which you can see here perhaps. Here is the fluoridated and here is the non-fluoridated set of 10 cities each. Before, here's where the fluoridation started. And before this time, both sets of cities were identical. But no sooner had fluoridation started than this curve began to go up. The deaths began to increase so that this effect occurs very promptly within one, two, or five years. Now this, sir, is conclusive evidence that fluor kills because of cancer. It is one of the most conclusive bits of scientific and biological evidence that I have come across in my 50 years in the field of cancer research. Would this then, in your opinion, be the end of fluor in water, in drinking water? It should be the end, and in the United States, it should so be the end by federal law known as the Delaney Amendment, which says that anything found to induce cancer in man or animals cannot be legally put into the food or drink of man or animals. And so, uh, and this is all less than one year old, so that it entirely changes any previous ideas of fluoridation that anyone may have had, because this is the first real indication of an important effect. Now, in, uh, in, in this country, of course, the state of the, uh, the dental state of the Union, the way people's teeth look, is incredible indeed. Would you say that uh, stopping fluor had other effects than increasing the dental problems in this country? Well, I would rather look at it that it would certainly help the cancer death situation in this country, which I'm sure most people would agree is far more important than a temporary benefit to teeth in adolescent children. Now, this, uh, this, this, you see, amounts to public murder on a grand scale. It is a public crime, it would be, to put fluoride in the drinking water of people. Now, the children of this cameraman and mine, sir, take fluor. Should we stop this immediately? Well, in my opinion, if they were my children, uh, they would not take it anymore. I can only recommend for myself, but I would suggest to you that they stop it. Is there a difference uh, in having fluor in drinking water or administering little fluor pills to children? Well, of course, the little fluor pills are a much smaller proposition than drinking gallons of water per day or per week, as well as taking a bath in it and washing your automobile in it, and watering your lawns. That's a very massive thing compared to uh, brushing teeth with fluoridated toothpaste. But uh, our work is immediately concerned with drinking water. What happens to toothpaste, I'm quite willing to uh, let the future studies go into that in more detail. They call them wet scrubbers. 
The pollution control devices used by the phosphate industry to capture fluoride gases produced in the production of commercial fertilizer. In the past, when the industry let these gases escape, vegetation became scorched, crops destroyed, and cattle crippled. Today, with the development of sophisticated air pollution control technology, less of the fluoride escapes into the atmosphere, and the type of pollution that threatened the survival of some communities in the 1950s and 60s is but a thing of the past, at least in the U.S. and other wealthy countries. However, the impacts of the industry's fluoride emissions are still being felt, although more subtly, by millions of people, people who for the most part do not live anywhere near a phosphate plant. That's because after being captured in the scrubbers, the fluoride acid, hydrofluorosilic acid, a classified hazardous waste, is barreled up and sold, unrefined, to communities across the country. Communities add hydrofluorosilic acid to their water supplies as the primary fluoride chemical for water fluoridation. Even if you don't live in a community where fluoride is added to the water, you're still getting a high dose of it through cereal, soda, juice, beer, and any other processed food and drink manufactured with fluoridated water. Fluoride has been and remains to this day one of the largest liabilities of the phosphate industry. The source of the problem lies in the fact that raw phosphate ore contains high concentrations of fluoride, usually between 20,000 and 40,000 parts per million, equivalent to 2 to 4 percent of the ore. When this ore is processed into water-soluble phosphate via the addition of sulfuric acid, the fluoride content of the ore is vaporized into the air, forming highly toxic gaseous compounds, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. In the past, when the industry had little, if any, pollution control, the fluoride gases were frequently emitted in large volumes into the surrounding communities, causing serious environmental damage. In Polk County, Florida, the creation of multiple phosphate plants in the 1940s caused damage to nearly 25,000 acres of citrus groves and, quote, mass fluoride poisoning, unquote, of cattle. It estimated that the, as a result of the fluoride contamination, the cattle population of Polk County dropped 30,000 head between 1953 and 1960, and an estimated 150,000 acres of cattle land were abandoned. Damage to vegetation and livestock caused by fluoride emissions from large industry has resulted, as one might expect, in a great deal of expensive litigation. In 1983, Dr. Leonard Weinstein of Cornell University stated that certainly there had been more litigation on alleged damage to agriculture by fluoride than all other pollutants combined. While Weinstein was referring to fluoride pollution in general, his comments give an indication of a problem facing the phosphate industry one of the most notorious emitters of fluoride in the early days. So too does an estimate from Dr. Ewan Groth, currently a senior scientist at Consumers Union. According to an article written by Groth, fluoride pollution between the years 1957 to 1968, quote, was responsible for more damage claims against industry than all 20 nationally monitored air pollutants combined. According to Hodge and Smith in 1977, the primary reason for the litigation against fluoride emitters was the, quote, painful, economic, disastrous, debilitating disease that fluoride causes to livestock. Lilly in 1970 said, quote, airborne fluorides have caused more worldwide damage to domestic animals than any other air pollutant. Due to the inevitable liabilities that fluoride pollution presented and to the increasingly stringent set of environmental regulations, the phosphate industry began cleaning up its act. As noted by Irving Bellick, a chemist at the U.S. Public Health Service, quote, in the manufacture of superphosphate fertilizer, phosphate rock is acidulated with sulfuric acid and the fluoride content of the rock evolves as volatile silical fluorides. In the past, much of this volatile material was vented to the atmosphere, contributing heavily to pollution of the air and the land surrounding the manufacturing site. As awareness of the pollution problem increased, scrubbers were added to strip particulate and gaseous compounds from the waste gas. Considering the great demand among big industry for fluoride chemicals as a material used in a wide variety of commercial products and industrial processes, the phosphate industry could have made quite a handsome profit selling its fluoride wastes to industry. This was indeed the hope of some industry analysts. However, the U.S. phosphate industry has thus far been unable to take advantage of this market. The principal reason for this failure stems from the fact that fluoride captured in the scrubbers is combined with silica. The resulting silica fluoride complex has in turn proved difficult for the industry to separate and purify in an economically viable process. 
As it now stands, silical fluoride complexes, hydrofluorosilic acid and sodium silical fluoride, are of little use to industry. Thus, while U.S. industry continues to satisfy its growing demand for high-grade fluoride chemicals by importing calcium fluoride from abroad, primarily Mexico, China, and South Africa, the phosphate industry continues dumping large volumes of fluoride into acidic wastewater ponds that lie at the top of mountainous waste piles which surround the industry. Of course, not all the phosphate industry's fluoride waste is disposed of in the ponds. As noted earlier, the phosphate industry has found at least one regular customer of its silico fluorides, municipal water treatment facilities. According to recent estimates, the phosphate industry sells approximately 200,000 tons of silico fluorides, hydrofluoric acid and sodium silico fluoride, to U.S. communities each year for use as water fluoridation agents. In 1983, Rebecca Hanmer from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency described the policy of using phosphate industry silico fluorides for fluoridation as follows, quote, In regards to the use of fluorosilic acid as the source of fluoride for fluoridation, this agency regards such use as an ideal solution to a long-standing problem. By recovering the byproduct fluorosilic acid from fertilizer manufacturing, water and air pollution are minimized and water authorities have a low-cost source of fluoride available to them. Another EPA official, Dr. J. William Hersey, the current senior vice president of EPA Headquarters Union, recently expressed a different view on the matter. According to Hersey, quote, if this stuff gets into our air, it's a pollutant. If it gets into a river, it's a pollutant. If it gets into a lake, it's a pollutant. But if it goes right into your drinking water system, it's not a pollutant? That's amazing. There's got to be a better way to manage this stuff. Adding to Hizzy's concerns are three recent findings. First and foremost are two recent studies reporting a relationship between water treated with silico fluorides and elevated levels of lead in children's blood. The authors of these studies speculate that the silico fluoride complex may increase the uptake of lead derived from other environmental sources such as lead paint into the bloodstream. The second finding is the recent and quite remarkable concession from the EPA that despite 50 years of water fluoridation, the EPA has no chronic health studies on silico fluorides. All safety studies on fluoride to date have been conducted using pharmaceutical grade sodium fluoride, not industrial grade silico fluorides. The defense made by the agencies promoting water fluoridation, such as U.S. Centers for Disease Control, to the lack of studies is that when the silico fluoride complex is diluted into water, it dissociates into free fluoride ions, or fluoride compounds, and thus the treated water when consumed will have no remaining silico fluoride residues. This argument, while supported by a good deal of theoretical calculation, is backed by a notable lack of laboratory data. Moreover, a recently obtained and translated Ph.D. dissertation from a German chemist contradicts the claims. According to the dissertation, not only do the silico fluorides not fully dissociate, the remaining silico fluoride complexes are more potent inhibitors of chlorinesterase, an enzyme vital to the functioning of the central nervous system. A third finding, although perhaps of less concern, is that the silico fluorides, as obtained from the scrubbers of the phosphate industry, contain a wide variety of impurities present in processed water, including arsenic, lead, and possibly radionuclides. While these impurities occur at low concentrations, especially after dilution into water, their purposeful addition to water supplies directly violates EPA public health goals. As noted by the Salt Lake Tribune, those who had visions of sterile white laboratories when they voted for fluoride weren't thinking of fluorosilic acid. Improbable as this sounds, much of it is recovered from the scrubbing solution that scours toxin from smokestacks at phosphate fertilizer plants. Silico fluorides corrode glass and they are added directly to our water supplies.